So we're actually going to use both of your answers. So in terms of just the derivative, the derivative of 1 over s is negative 1 over s squared. And if you're interested in how that happened, this is the same thing as calculating the derivative of s to the negative 1. Notice the negative 1 comes out front, and then you'll have s to the negative 2, but convert it back to a fraction, you'll have negative 1 over s squared. But then when you flip the sign, this guy is totally going to turn into just 1 over s squared. And that's it. Okay. So that would be your derivative, not your derivative, that would be your Laplace transform of t, would be 1 over s squared. So now let's try to build the equation for Laplace transform of t squared. And I'm going to claim we can do the same thing. We can rewrite this guy as t times something inside those curly braces. Any guesses what that blank should be? What should t be multiplied by to get t squared? Yep, and all of you guys write that have answered so far, it would totally just be a t here. That means in terms of applying that rule that's in black at the very top, this would be negative derivative of the Laplace transform of t. Now, the nice thing is we just found the Laplace transform of t, so I'm going to drop it in. So this is going to be negative the derivative of 1 over s squared. Anybody have a guess what the derivative of 1 over s squared would be? Ooh, I've got one guess so far. Ooh, I've got another guess so far. And it's not the same guess. Anybody else have a guess? Ooh, multiple guesses. Awesome. No one guess has been the same yet. All right, so here's the trick. I am not going to want to write that arrow there. Let me move that arrow so we don't have an issue later on. So the trick here is we're looking at the derivative of s to the negative 2. So you'll pull out the negative 2 out front and have s to the negative 3 left. So those of you who said s raised to a cube power on the denominator, you were totally right, and it was just dealing with the coefficient out front. So here, what happens, that is exactly the same as negative 2 over s cubed. And then we're going to flip the sign on it. And when we flip the sign on that guy, we'll get positive 2 over s cubed. Now let's do one more of these examples. Let's compute the Laplace transform of t cubed. And then we'll make a guess of what we think the Laplace transform of t to some positive integer would be. So we'll repeat the exact same process. We'll have t times something. That t out front is going to give us a negative derivative of the Laplace transform of whatever is going to be in that blank. And then we'll have to compute it. So anybody have a guess what would be in that blank? t gets multiplied by what to give you t cubed, in other words? Excellent. So yep, this guy would be t squared. Always double check, multiply it together. Do we actually get t cubed? And hopefully you're all thinking yes. Okay. So we're going to take the Laplace transform of t squared, which we already know from the previous line. So we'll look at the Laplace transform of t squared, which is 2 over s cubed. And then we'll do the exact same thing we did before. So this is going to be negative of something. Anybody have a guess what should go in there? In other words, what's the derivative of 2 over s cubed? Ooh, I've got a lot of answers. One of them is right. So for this guy, you're looking for the derivative of 2 times s to the negative 3. So we'll move the negative 3 out front, so that would be negative 6. S to the subtract 1 from the exponent, so that would be S to the negative 4. Or put this in a fraction, this would be negative 6 over S to the 4. And then you flip the sign, and so that's where you get positive 6 over S to the 4. Okay. 
So that there would give you what the answer or the Laplace transform would be for T cubed. And if you wanted to, these guys here can all be considered their own little special rules. So if you wanted to do the special cases for all of those polynomials, you totally could. Okay? However, let's jump to the actual rule that's T to the N. So this would be like in derivatives or integrals, the rule for X to the N, except we use T. Okay? So it's definitely going to be a fraction. Anybody have a guess what would be in the bottom of the fraction? What would be their denominator here? If you have T raised to the N as your original guy, it will be S raised to a power, but what power? If we look at their previous examples, the exponent in the Laplace transform always relates to the exponent on T by add 1. So we'll be S to the N plus 1 down there. And does anybody have a guess what would go in the numerator, what would go on the top of the fraction? Ooh, good guess. Not going to lie, I didn't think you guys would grab with the factorials. Good job. So, yes, totally going to be a factorial. That's actually a hallmark of if you're taking derivatives of things, is you're going to end up with a factorial somewhere in your coefficient. We took a bunch of derivatives, so we were definitely going to end up with some sort of factorial involved here. So that right there is the formula if you have t raised to any exponent, except I'm lying, there's a caveat here. Caveat is that n must be 0, 1, 2, 3. It's got to be a proper integer, cannot be negative. And part of that reason is our factorials are defined as integers. Uh, zero factorial is defined as 1, 1 factorial is 1, 2 factorial, 3 factorial, 7 factorial, we can calculate all of those guys. Okay. So the question, of course, is you guys have dealt with both Calc 1 and Calc 2 with derivatives and integrals, and we've been saying that Laplace transforms are similar. Have you always dealt with polynomial-like functions that only had non-negative integer exponents? Did you ever have other types of exponents in your things that look like polynomials? In other words, can you put a non-integer up in an exponent? What do you guys think? Yeah. Now, I'm not trying to be fancy. I was just thinking something like x to the 1 half. Is that something that seems logical like you might see in the future? Yeah. It's totally possible. This formula right here? isn't going to be able to handle that, mainly because of the factorial on the top. So what people did is they said, but I still have to deal with those functions. So it turns out there is now an adjusted version of this formula. And this adjusted version does actually work if you have just integers. But it own, but it's the formula that you have to use if your exponent is not an integer. So let's go ahead and put a line here to break to do our other formula. And I'm just going to give you this other formula. So this other formula is t raised to the, and I'm going to use the little symbol alpha because that's pretty common. And this guy is s raised to the exponent of alpha minus 1. So that part's identical to what we just built. Here's the part that changes. On the top of the fraction, you have this guy called a gamma function, and we'll go over the details of gamma function in just a second. Inside the parentheses is gamma plus 1. So notice in terms of remembering things, this one is almost easier to remember if we knew what the gamma function was. Why? Because we have the alpha plus 1 and the alpha plus 1. Now there's a couple of caveats here. First thing is s is bigger than 0, so that just gives us our domain. Actually, I forgot to do that on the last one, so let me put in s is bigger than 0 up there too. And the other thing is that alpha, it turns out this alpha actually needs to be bigger than negative 1, but it can be any real number you want. Uh, for our class, I will only give you an alpha value that's some fraction over 2. So like 1 half 
one third, five halves, negative one half. Okay? So only fractions over two. You'll see why here in just a second. All right, so next let's talk about what this gamma function is. And it turns out with our gamma function, there's a couple of properties that you need to know. Okay? Gamma function is defined by way of an integral, kind of like what the Laplace transform is. It's complicated, and I don't want to get into all of those complicated things. I'm just going to give you the bare minimum of what you need to know to compute the Laplace transform. If you ever have to take statistics, specifically a calculus-based statistics, you will most likely see the gamma function in the future. If you don't, you may never have to see the gamma function in the future. So here's what you need to know. First thing is gamma function, if you plug in 1, is actually going to turn out to be the number 1. Awesome. Okay. The next thing is the big property that we actually uh, deal with. And this big property is this guy. If you have x plus 1, being plugged into the gamma function. The property says this is the same as gamma of x multiplied by x. This is exactly the same thing as writing this as gamma of x equals 1 less, so x minus 1, times gamma of x minus 1. Personal preference, which you use, the official one is the first one I wrote. Okay. Now, if you actually have, ah, an integer. So I'm going to use n to represent an integer right here. It turns out gamma of n plus 1 is simply reduces to n factorial if you apply this formula a bunch of times. And the last time you'll end up with gamma of 1, which equals 1. So it would simplify to n factorial. Notice if your exponent in the Laplace transform is an integer n, you would get this guy. This would reduce to an n factorial, and notice that's where the n factorial came at, came from, right here in the top. Now, of course, we saw it come from derivatives as well, but this tells you that this t to the n formula is a special case of the t to the alpha formula. And the last property is the one we're going to need. And this last property is why I told you I will only, in our class, you'll only use this formula if your alpha is something over 2. It turns out gamma, when you plug one half into the function, gives you back a square root of pi. Yep, I know. I know. Not necessarily the number you expected to see. So let's see how this would look. So let's calculate a couple of values for gamma, and then we'll look at some examples with Laplace transforms with integer exponents and then some non-integer exponents. So, examples. So, first one is, suppose you wanted to calculate gamma of 3 halves. Well, I didn't actually give you what the function was for the gamma function. So, you can't just plug it into the function and compute something at the end. This isn't gamma of 1, so you can't immediately get to the answer. This isn't gamma of 1 half, so you can't immediately get to the answer. This is not an integer, so you can't use this factorial formula. So in terms of what you've got to use, we have to use this property right here, which says gamma of x plus 1 equals x times gamma of x. So what you have to figure out is what is x. So this is something where you say, all right, I'm going to rewrite my gamma function as something plus 1. And then that's something that's going to be our x. So what do you think? 1 plus what equals 3 halves? A, hmm? So this would be 1 half. So this tells you that in our formula, x equals 1 half. Now we can go ahead and plug into our formula. And our formula says, hey, we're supposed to have x, so the 1 half, times gamma of x, so gamma of 1 half. Then you notice hey, I've got gamma of 1 half. I also have a value for gamma of 1 half. So this means we can just replace our gamma with 1 half of 1 half with that square root of pi. And that would be your answer. We can do the same thing 
if the gamma value, if the value of, that we were plugging into gamma was bigger. So maybe we do something like gamma of five halves. In this case, you'd say, all right, something plus one equals five halves. Any guesses what we should add to one to get five halves? Ooh, almost. Yep. So this one would be three halves. The trick here is subtract the bottom from the top. Then you would still have a fraction over two. Okay. So we'll get three halves plus one. So x here is three halves. This would then tell us we'll have I'll use that formula, the first one right up here. So we'll go ahead and have x x is our 3 halves, times gamma of x, so that would be gamma of 3 halves. Now, here's the interesting part with this larger number that we started with, this number of 5 halves. Can we f just plug in the value of gamma of 3 halves if we didn't have the question we just worked? Well, we do have the question we just worked, so we could actually plug in the value for gamma of 3 halves, but if you didn't have this previous work, you'd have to replicate all of that previous work. So this guy would be, well, you'd say I'd have three halves. I need to rewrite gamma as one half plus one. My new x that I'm going to be using for my equation is going to be x equals one half. And now we'll have one half times gamma of one half. Notice you kept the three halves out front. Now we know what gamma of one half is. So gamma of one half is that square root of pi. And if we put this all together, this would be 3 root pi all over 4. Now, you guys at this point in your mathematical careers have all dealt with factorials at least once, regardless of whether you loved it, hated it, or didn't care one way or the other. Okay? This gamma function with the 1 halves actually acts like a factorial. There are some exceptions. Okay? So notice what's going on with our final answer right here. This, let me put it in a comment, so a different color. This three halves right here, this is like our original number. I don't want to use x's or n's. Ah! Brain freeze. Let's call it, let's call it y because I'm being lazy. So this would be like y minus 1. This guy would be like y minus 2. And before you can get into negative numbers, always end with a square root pi. Okay. So let's do one more of these examples and see if that strategy holds up where you subtract one and you keep subtracting one until what? Until you get down to your last positive number before you would have gotten a negative number. And then we'll multiply it off with square root pi at the end. So maybe we do something like gamma of Oh, I don't know. How about seven halves? Okay. So this one here, the formal way that we would do this is we'd say one plus something equals seven halves. Any guesses what should go in that blank? Yep. So this would be five halves, with the trick being you just subtract two from the top. Now this tells us x equals 5 halves, so 5 halves out front, 5 halves in the middle. Now, 5 halves can be written as something plus 1, so what is that something, the new x value? Anybody have a guess for that next x value? Hmm? This one will be 3 halves. Now, I'm going to be lazy at this point. Notice, as soon as we got here to the 5 halves, we have somebody we've computed before. So I'm going to go ahead and just write down what that answer is. So we've got the 5 halves, and then we'll plug in for this part. So 5 halves, and then we have 3 halves, and then we have 1 half, and then we have square root pi. Notice what happened. 5 halves, we subtracted 1. 3 halves, we subtracted 1 again. 1 half, we subtracted 1 again. And when we got to 1 half, the next term was going to be that square root. So that's the fast way to compute any gamma function value if it's blank over pi.
No, no, no. If it's something over two, excuse me. And then if you wanted to go ahead and simplify this thing this, or combine it together, this would be 15 times square root pi on the top and 8 on the bottom. All right. So there's your crash course in the gamma function. What do we care about? We care about Laplace transforms. So let's use the two new formulas, the t to the n formula and the t to the alpha formula, and now our information with gamma, and see if we can't calculate some Laplace transforms. So suppose we have the following Laplace transforms. And since we've been talking about gamma function, let's start off with some of the funky ones. So suppose we were looking for, or we wanted to compute the Laplace transform of, oh, I don't know, how about 1 plus 4 times t raised to the 3 halves power. So for this one, there's a couple of things going on. One of the things is linearity. So linearity says if you're adding multiple terms together, you can just take the Laplace transform of the individual terms. So this is exactly the same as the Laplace transform of 1 plus 4 times the Laplace transform of t to the 3 halves. And then we just have to compute those two Laplace transforms. Now, anybody remember what the Laplace transform of 1 was? Yep, perfect. So it's 1 over s. Now, anybody have a guess on how we should calculate the Laplace transform of this guy? So let me write out our two rules to the side so we can see them. So we had the Laplace transform of t to the n was n factorial over s to the n plus 1. And then we had the Laplace transform of t to the alpha, and that was gamma of alpha plus 1 over s to the alpha plus 1. So the first question is, do you want to use formula one or formula two? Ooh, I have guesses for both of them. Anybody remember how to tell the difference of when to use which of these two formulas? It's super duper subtle. It turns out formula two you can always use, but when's the criteria when to use formula one, that top formula, that t to the n formula? Condition is on n. n has to be what? Or our exponent has to be what? Our exponent has to be an integer, so quick check. What's our exponent? Is it an integer? Technically, the term is non-negative integer, only because you can include zero. But if you want to think positive integer, that works fine, because we have the own separate um, formula for when you have t to the zero or one. So in our case, what's our exponent that we're looking at? Is it an integer, or a non-negative integer, or if you prefer a positive integer? All right, so here, our exponent is the 3 over 2, so that's not an integer, it's a fraction, so we're going to use our um, second guy right there, simply because that's the only one that can handle a non-integer exponent. Okay? So I'm going to go over to the side here and do a little bit of scratch work, and the little bit of scratch work to the side here is that alpha equals 3 halves. That just allows me to do some plug-in for this particular um, formula over here. To the side, or you can do this in your formula too, either way. I also want to do, add 1 to our alpha. Well, what is 3 halves plus 1? Anybody got that? So 5 over 2, perfect. So we want to put 5 over 2 in the exponent in the denominator. 
that was attempting the S raised to the exponent of 5 over 2. I realized my hand shook a little there. And I went ahead and just left the gamma function on the top as 3 halves plus 1. Now notice the 3 halves plus 1 up here is actually already in that desirable format for our formula for our gamma function. It's the x plus 1. So our alpha that we got from our Laplace transform rule will always, for the first iteration, be this same as the x right there. Now, we could also be super sneaky and say, hey, this guy of, well, let's scroll it down just a hair, this guy of gamma of 3 halves plus 1 is the same as this second example we did up here, which means our final answer should be the thing that is totally hidden, just a second, should be our 3 fourths square root pi. Huh? Or if we write it out how we would get it in terms of computing gamma function, we'll get the following. So we'll get 1 over s plus 4, and here we'll get 3 halves times 1 half times square root pi all over s to 5 over 2. Kind of a mess, but we're going to simplify. So if we go ahead and simplify this thing, anybody notice what cancels in that second piece? Well, it's not the S raised to the 5 halves, so let's put that in there. But the top of the fraction will simplify. Can't do anything with your square root of pi, so that stays in there. So what should I write in front of the square root of pi? So the 4 will cancel with the bottom of the 3 halves and with the 1 half. So we'll end up with just a 3 up top. I'm not going to claim that they always cancel, but in this case, because I had that coefficient of 4 at the very beginning, it on purpose did cancel. And I tried to do that somewhat for you guys so you don't have crazy fractions involved all the time. Okay. So that would be how you would deal with the Laplace transform rule that has the alpha in it. Now, you're not going to see tons of those because I'm not going to give you too many. If you see them, you'll see something like t raised to the 1 half power or t raised to the 3 halves power. But let's do some examples with the other formula. And this other formula you'll use all the time when you have polynomials. So maybe you have something like this guy. Maybe you're asked to compute the Laplace transform of, oh, I don't know, how about t to the fourth minus 3t squared plus 5. So just like before, you can take the Laplace transform of each of these individual pieces. You could totally write this out as Laplace transform of t to the fourth minus 3 times Laplace transform of t squared. Plus, if you wanted to pull the 5 out front, you could. And if you did, that would be the same as 5 times the Laplace transform of 1. But since we did have that special rule where you could add just the constant, you'd leave the 5 inside too. You also don't have to write the step I just wrote. And the more you do Laplace transforms, the less you're going to write this step. So any guesses what we should do to go ahead and compute these Laplace transforms? Don't overthink it. So any guesses what the Laplace transform of t to the fourth is? Yep. So I'm going to go ahead and do it in two steps. So this would be 4, here's a second, 4 factorial over s to the, and don't forget to add 1 to the exponent. So 4 plus 1. Huh? Then we'll have 3 times. What would be the Laplace transform of t squared? Anybody got that one? So that one, the 2 from the squared, whoa, the 2 from the squared would be 2 factorial on the top, and you'll get s to the 2 plus 1 or s cubed on the bottom. And yes, I know that many of you don't need me to do those middle steps, 
I just want to make sure we're all comfortable with where the numbers were coming from in the format. So let's go ahead and clean this up. 4 factorial is the same as 24. So this would be 24 over s to the fifth minus 2 factorial is the same as 2. So 2 times 3 is 6 on the top. And the bottom would be s cubed. And the last one, which we didn't talk about, was 5 over s. I realize my 5 and my s's are not awesomely distinguishable. Sorry about that. And then in terms of the domain, this would be all of them were based on rules where s was bigger than 0. And that's it for polynomials. There's really not anything more going on with the polynomials. Questions make sense? Kind of feeling OK. While you guys are thinking of questions, I'm going to go ahead and insert those rules over in our other page. So we had here t was 1 over s squared. t to the n was n factorial over s to the n plus 1. Our gamma was a gamma of alpha plus 1 over s to the alpha plus 1. And these guys that we haven't talked about yet, if you multiply t to the n times an e to the at, this was the rule that said, place all of your s's with s minus a. So I'm just going to swap them out. So this guy would be n factorial over s minus a to the n plus 1. And the 1 down here would still be that same gamma of alpha plus 1. But instead of s raised to the n plus 1 on the bottom, it would be s minus a raised to the n plus 1 in the side. And that's it for all of our continuous rules. So let's have another example of these guys, and then we'll move on to our discontinuous guys. And while we're here, let me go ahead and give you the rest of the properties. If you multiply any function by a t to the n, this turns out to be negative 1 raised to the n times the nth derivative of the Laplace transform of whatever that function was going to be originally. Okay. So each time you have an extra copy of t, that extra copy of t will give you an extra derivative. The same thing we did when we built the formula for t to the n. And these last three here that we're not going to use today, but we'll need um, next week, like every time we do a problem, is going to be the Laplace transform of derivatives. So it turns out the Laplace transform of first derivative is s times the Laplace transform of whatever the function was, then subtract the value of the function at 0. The second derivative will be an s squared times the Laplace transform of the original function minus s times whatever the value of the function is at 0, then minus the first derivative of the function evaluated at 0. That was trying to be a 0, I promise. Notice what happens. You start with an s to the exponent where the exponent matches your derivative. You multiply this by the Laplace transform of s. Then everybody else is subtracted. And what happens here is whatever your power of s is, it decreases one each time until you get to the term that has no s. So immediately in the first one, out to three terms in the second one. You start at f with no derivatives, and then you keep s. adding derivatives until, again, you turn that as less. So in the general format, if you have the derivatives at the end, times the Laplace transform of whatever your function is, then you would have s to the end of this one, so that is and the f actually is 1 less, multiplied by f to the 0. Next, one is smaller, and this will be your first derivative, plug in 0. And it keeps on going. Your last term that has an s in it would be the n minus second derivative, you plug in 0. And the last term would be when there's no s's, f to the 0, but this is the n minus first derivative. Whew. I hate writing that formula. For us, we're only going to see these really, we'll probably only get up to second order differential equations. So these two are really the two big ones that you need to worry about. Okay. But again, not going to need them today. Um, let's see. So we said examples. Let's jump back to doing a couple of examples, and then we'll get into our discontinuous guys. I'm trying to scroll down, and it doesn't want me to. All right, so more examples. So I wanted to make sure that we did one of these examples. 
because we did something similar to it last time, but not exactly the same. And I wanted to point out something that happens all the time with Laplace transforms. So this guy is the Laplace transform of e to the negative 2t sine of square root 2 times t, and then plus 2 e to the negative 2t cosine of square root 2 times t. Oh, and I'll throw something on at the end. Maybe you have something like, oh, I don't know, maybe a 3t squared e to the t. So this is something that can occur all the time. So if we wanted to compute this guy, first thing you notice is that you can break it up into three components. So for this first guy, we're looking at a sine function. And it's a sine function being multiplied by an e function. Okay? So with a sine function, the key thing that you want to notice is what your k is. So anybody have a guess what the k is for this particular example? We're also going to have to find the a from the e component. Yep, so this is going to be square root 2. Anybody grab what the a is for this first term? Yep, so this guy would be negative 1. So if we go ahead and start applying the rule, this is one of the rules that we had last time, so I'm going to switch back to the rule real quick. And it is right here. Okay, so we had the sine, we had the e. Notice what happens, the k is going to go up top. We have the s squared plus k squared on the bottom, except no, we don't. We shifted by a, so this is going to be s minus a. That's the rule we're about to use. Jumping back to our example. So we'll have k on the top. So that's our square root 2. On the bottom, we have s minus something squared. And then we have our k squared, so that's our square root 2 squared. So s minus a, our a is negative 2. So s minus negative 2 is positive 2, and we'll clean that up on the next. And that's it. Now we'll do the same thing with our next term. Now our next term has a coefficient out front, so we can go ahead and just copy down the coefficient right now. We're going to be dealing with a cosine term. So our cosine term, we need to figure out a k. And we also have an e term, so it's shifted. And here we're going to need to figure out an a. Anybody have what the k would be here? and then we're going to need to grab the a. Yeah, so this one is exactly the same as before. So the k is square root 2. Make sure I copy it down correctly this time. And for cosine, it's s over s squared plus k squared. So here we'll have our k squared, the square root 2 quantity squared. And then for the s, s on top and s squared on the bottom, it's going to be shifted, so it's really s minus a. But a was negative 2, so it's really s plus 2. And that's it for that second term. Now, third term. That third term can be calculated two different ways. It can either be calculated where you figure out what the Laplace transform of e to the t is, and then you take the derivative two times. Or you figure out what the Laplace transform of t squared is, and then you replace all of your s's with an s minus a. I'm going to do the second way because it's easier. Okay. So here, in the formula, you'll just need to know what n is. So what would be the n that I'm referring to here? Any guesses? 2 or the exponent. Perfect. That means we can use our nice, wonderful integer version formula. And we also need an a. Any guesses what the a is here? It would be the coefficient on the t in the exponent of the e function, so that would be a 1. So what we're going to do here is we are just going to go ahead and compute the Laplace transform of t squared like normal. And then we're going to swap out the s for an s minus a or an s minus so we'll have 3 as the coefficient. We'll just keep it out front. And then for t squared, well, we already computed this one. It's 2 factorial, or 2 on the top. And then s raised to the 2 plus 1 on the denominator, or 2 plus 1 is 3. I like to put parentheses where I would normally put my s's. That way I don't have to do two steps. And inside the parentheses is normally where I'd write the s, so I can just remember 
the normal old formula without the adjustment, and then I go back and fill in the S minus A. So here I'm going to go back to the parentheses and fill in the S minus A. Now, sometimes you're done at this stage, sometimes you need a little bit of cleanup, and for us, we need just a little bit of cleanup. So for the first fraction, this is exactly the same thing as square root 2 over S squared plus 2 whole quantity squared plus 2. If you wanted to multiply that out and add them together, totally fine to do. And the second term is 2S plus 4 on the top and S squared plus 2 quantity squared, S plus 2 quantity squared plus 2 on the bottom. Last fraction, 6 over S minus 1 quantity cubed, and there's no reason whatsoever to multiply out that last one. Now, here's why we did this particular question. Notice, notice anything about those first two fractions. They have the same denominator, exactly. So it is something that you see all the time we have both a sine and a cosine with the same angle, and what commonly happens is these two guys will get added together. So you've got 2s plus 4 plus that root 2 all combined together over the same denominator. And if you wanted to multiply out that denominator, this part right here would actually be what? This would be s squared plus 4s plus 4, but add 2, so plus 6. I'm not going to worry about that other than doing that comment over to the side. Huh. This, of course, makes our life miserable when we try to undo Laplace transforms, but it's a really, really common thing to see with Laplace transforms. Huh. Questions kind of make sense a little bit okay in terms of your Laplace transforms. The only thing left I've got planned in terms of talking about Laplace transforms is the discontinuous functions. So any questions before we jump into discontinuous functions? Oh, I guess I should give you a heads up. Note. Suppose you got one of these two guys. Any guesses what you would need to do if you wanted to try to compute either of those two Laplace transforms? It's the same technique in both of them. It, it's not a shifting like with E. No guesses? Ooh, good call. So, yes, you guys who are typing it in, you are totally correct. You're going to need to start taking derivatives, and technically it's the negative derivative. So this guy here would be the negative derivative of the formula for sine of kt. Wow, I didn't write sine. That's terrible. So sine kt. So this would be negative derivative of, and for sine, sine is k over s squared plus k squared. That might not be a derivative you want to compute, but it's totally one that's relatively straightforward. You can move the denominator, the s squared plus k squared up to the top with a new exponent of a negative 1 around the whole thing. You can take that derivative, the negative 1 will come out front, it'll cancel actually with the negative in front of the derivative, you'll get the derivative of this inside stuff to come out, so that would be 2s, it'll multiply by the k, and then the new exponent would be negative 2. So this turns out to be the 2s gets multiplied by the k, the negative from this guy being on the denominator will cancel out front, the new denominator would be s squared plus k squared whole quantity b squared. Huh? Now let's you guys check that out. 
Same deal happens with cosine, except cosine is a little more, a little more obnoxious. Anybody have a guess why it's more work to compute this derivative of the Laplace transform of cosine? All right, I'm about to write down the rule, so it may be obvious once you see the rule. You got it. It's the S up there in the numerator. So if you calculate this, I'm not going to lie, I took about four lines on my whiteboard here that I have at home to go ahead and write all this out and then put it in a simplified form. So I figured I'd go ahead and give you what that formula is. Once you take that derivative, maybe you use quotient rule, maybe you move the bottom of the fraction up to the top and put it all inside an exponent of negative one and use a product rule. Take the derivative, you then flip the signs of everybody. This should come out to be s squared minus k squared on the top and same denominator on the bottom as before. So s squared plus k squared, whole quantity squared. Definitely go and check that and make sure you believe how you got to that rule. Okay. These two guys come up every so often. They're not going to come up in our class as frequently as some of the other rules, but I wanted to give you the heads up of some of the other things that you can see. These would be, for us at least, a little bit more obscure. All right, so that is officially everything with continuous, continuous functions and Laplace transforms. Let us jump now into our discontinuous functions. And there's two main functions that I want to talk about. One of them is called the unit step function. It actually has a name. It's called the heavyweight function. And when I was looking how to um, spell this, not heavyweight, heavy side, excuse me. Heavy side. When I was looking at how to spell it, because I always forget if that's an I or a Y, I found out something new. It's actually named after the name of a guy as opposed to a description. I always thought it was a description. Very convenient name on his part. Yeah. Now, what is this unit step function? In terms of how it's defined, it's typically given by a U or an H. H for heavyweight, U for unit step function. Your textbook uses a U, but a couple of your Weber problems used an H for heavyweight. Yeah. So just as a heads up. So this guy goes as follows. It's going to equal either 0 or 1. And it equals 0 when t is smaller than 0, and it equals 1 when t is bigger than 0. So in terms of what this guy looks like, if we graphed him, it's just a step function, a piecewise function. Over here, it's 0. This is my attempt to shade in. And over here, it's 1. Okay, so there's 1 and there's 0. This guy's used a lot, like a lot, a lot. Now, turns out sometimes when you're dealing with discontinuities, these step discontinuities, you don't want the break to be at t equals zero. Maybe you want it to be somewhere else. And this is where you can rewrite it at, if you replace the t with a t minus a, it shifts everything. So this is back in like a high school algebra class where you moved your functions right or left. This is moving our functions right or left. Some people actually use a subscript a little a there to indicate where this thing is going to break. And again, it still equals either 0 or 1, but now that breaking point is at the value a. Okay. So this same guy, except now here t equals a. Ah. And there's the other side. Okay. So that's, that's your step function. Unit, because it broke by a unit. Now, what happens if we actually looked at a couple of specific examples? And I'm not going to do too many of these examples. I'm just going to do a couple of key ones. So maybe you do something like, oh, I don't know. How about uh, you, and then we have t plus 3. So we'll look at that one. Maybe we also look at something, how you can change it. So maybe we look at 4 u minus 2, and maybe we look then at t times uh, u to the t minus 1. Okay, so here's what would happen with all of these guys. For the first one, your a 
And let me make it so we can actually see the formula up top here. For this first one, our A is negative 3. So this would totally be the formula 0, 1. And here your T, your formula would be 0 if T is less than negative 3, and 1 if T is greater than negative 3. So it looks just like this picture over here, except your break is at negative 3. So here's your negative 3. And it'll look kind of like that. Okay. Still at a level of 1. Now, the next two guys are the ones that, that happen a lot. And this is how we build piecewise functions with respect to Laplace transforms. So here, that 4, notice what the 4 does. is It's going to multiply by our unit step function. So 0 times 4 is still 0, but 1 times 4 is now 4. So whatever's out front, this coefficient, that's what's going to replace what would normally be a value of 1. The break is here at a equals 2. So if t is less than 2, it will be 0. But when t is bigger than 2, we're going to equal 4. So for the picture in this case, down here at t equals 4, I lied. t equals 0, I lied again. t equals 2, mouth is now hopefully working. We will still have this thing that looks similar. So you've got two lines. They break here at t equals 2. But now the level of that second non-zero line is up at 4. Okay. Last example. Last one down here. We're going to apply the same idea as before. Our a, where the break occurs, is going to be at 1. 0 stays at 0. But when t is 1 or bigger, this is where you multiply by the t out front. So here's where you get your equation. Equation, and it's a proper equation, not just a constant number. So when we graph this thing, I'm going to go ahead and graph in a dotted line the line y equals x, or y equals t, if you will. So it at t equals 1 is where the break occurs. So the step function, or really the piecewise function, is now going to follow along that function t. For 4, then, all zeros. This occurs in physical applications all the time. It's like you turn the machine on, you went from zero, nothing happening, to bam, whatever's supposed to be happening. Okay? Now, let's see how we would actually use this thing. And in terms of actually using this thing, we need to know what their Laplace transforms are. Okay? So let me go ahead and I'm just going to give you the rules for the Laplace transforms. And then we'll look at an example of calculating them. Okay. So if we look at the Laplace transform of a unit function, unit step function, I'll go ahead and do the general case where it can break at any point it wants to. It turns out the Laplace transform of this guy is, well, the definition is so you run it through that integral that goes from 0 to infinity. But now, because the Laplace transform isn't defined until you get to A, you actually have a a little bit more left. So this guy is going to be e raised to the negative a s. I was trying to be an s. All divided by s. The divide by s is the 1 over s that we got from the same place that we got from the Laplace transform of 1. The extra factor here of the e raised to the negative a t comes from the unit step function part, where it's not defined all the way, excuse me, all the way down to t equals 0. Now, there is another formula that we want to use, and it turns out there's two versions of this guy. And it doesn't matter which one you use. So you'll see one of them in your book, and it's some function f, and you plug in t minus a inside of that function, times the step function, and then matched. We're not going to use this one. But the formula is really nice. It is simply e to the negative a s. Actually, if you want to use it, you can. And it's going to be the Laplace transform of that function s. Okay. Turns out, in practice, it's easier to re rewrite that rule as some function where you're just plugging in t. And then you multiply it by your unit step function, or your heavy side function. This guy turns out to be e raised to the negative a s. And it's the Laplace transform of g when you plug in t plus a. 
So let's go ahead and look at an example of these guys. And I'll do one baby example, the first one, and then we'll do an example in that second case. So baby example first. Suppose you're asked to compute the Laplace transform of four times t minus two. So that function that we already computed up top. In terms of what you would do, that four comes out front, have the Laplace transform of the unit step function. The A here is two. And then you just plug it into the formula. So you'll have E raised to the negative A, so negative two, S, and then S on the bottom. Discontinuous functions are the only ones that still have E's involved with them when you get Laplace transform. Only ones. It's one of the indicators that you have a discontinuous function. Okay. So that's just a straight up dealing with the heavyweight function or the step function. Now, let's look at what happens if you multiply anything that's not a constant by your step function. And I'm gonna go ahead and grab t squared. So t squared times t times this unit step function where you plug in t minus one into that unit step function. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go ahead and use, oh, please work better. There we go. All right, so we are going to use this guy. Huh? The first thing that you do is you need to identify two things. You need to identify your G function and your A function, not A, your constant A. So A function in this case is always the thing you're subtracting from T in the unit function. So here A is one. Now, anybody have a guess what the G function has to be? Yep, it is totally going to be t squared, okay. which means we need to now compute that g function when you plug in t plus 1. So we're going to replace the t with a t plus 1, square it, and this guy would then be, I'm going to go ahead and multiply it out for us, t squared plus 2, t plus 1. Now, let's finish this off. Our answer is going to be, here is where we really need that formula. So it's going to be what? It's going to be E. Ah, I can't find my cursor. There it is. E to the negative AS. Then you multiply it by the Laplace transform O of the function we just computed. Okay. So E to the negative AS, A is 1, so just negative S. And then we're going to compute the Laplace transform of T squared plus 2T plus 1. Now we've just computed Laplace transforms of polynomials. So we know that t squared is 2 over s squared. We know that the Laplace transform of t is simply 1 over s squared. That's, I lie. Yeah, 1 over s squared. The previous one was over s cubed, excuse me. And the Laplace transform of 1 is s. And it is common to keep the e component factored outside, just like that. Okay? So that is a crash course on the discontinuous or step function guys um, with Laplace transforms. There is one other discontinuous thing, which is an impulse function, but we're not going to do anything on that one more than just what the formula is. So we'll do that at the very beginning of class next time. So next time we'll do the inverse Laplace transforms, and that's it.